Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Lahore Literary Festival and this significant session that puts a spotlight on a very unique phase in the life of one of Pakistan's most illustrious sons, Sahabzada Yaqub Khan, who everyone knows as a distinguished diplomat and an iconic foreign minister. Sahabzada Yaqub Khan left an indelible impression on everyone who met him via his persona and his knowledge. Upon seeing him, you saw a man of aristocratic bearing and manners, sophisticated and impeccably dressed, who spoke with finesse and behaved like a gentleman at all times, which he was. The Sahabzada's family antecedents are in the princely state of Rampur and Loharu in undivided India, where he was born in 1920, but more on that later. Sahabzada Yaqub Khan in a previous iteration was also Lieutenant General Yaqub Khan, one of the Pakistan Army's most eminent officers. He studied at the Royal Military Academy <clears throat> at Dehradun, commissioned in the British Indian Army in 1940, attached to the 18th Cavalry as second lieutenant from where the narrative of this wonderful book that we are presenting today begins. Sahabzada Yaqub Khan pursuits and experiences as prisoner of war. A lot of what we hear today would have just remained in the genre of oral history had this book not been written. Sahabzada Yaqub Khan, though a man who was in the limelight for all of his life, never chose to write an autobiography or talk at length about himself, especially when in the public eye. We will re revisit this thought as we proceed with the session. <coughs> And we will learn more about the unique aspects of Sahabzada's experiences as a prisoner of war and what he gained from this interregnum in his life. I'd like to now introduce our illustrious panelists today. On my left, it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome the author of the book, Lieutenant General Sayyid Ali Hamid. Major. Major General. Major General. <laughs> I'll accept that. <laughs> All right. Major General retired Sayyid Ali Hamid. Uh, the Major General was commissioned in the Armored Corps in 1968. He is a graduate of the Staff College Camberley and has served as an instructor at the Staff College Quetta and National Defense University Islamabad. He is a founding member of the Pakistan Army Institute of Military History and has also written a detailed history of the Armored Corps. And on this panel is Ambassador Tariq Fatmi, former diplomat and current special advisor to the President Government on Foreign Affairs. He has served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States twice and to the Soviet Union twice. Once. Um, <clears throat> and he's also been in places like Beijing, the European Union, and Zimbabwe. Mr. Fatmi is an expert on Russia and is fluent in the Russian language, which the Sahabzada was also fluent in. And finally, on, uh, in the end, Ms. Muniza Shamsi, who is a well-known writer, literary critic, and editor. She's the author of a literary history called Hybrid Tapestries, The Development of Pakistani Literature in English. She, ha she has edited and co-edited several award-winning literary encyclopedias and anthologies. She serves on several international literary advisory boards and is also a jury member of some of the prominent literary, literary awards in Pakistan. Her mother, Begum Jahanara Habibullah, was Sahabzada Yaqub Khan's sister. And out of all of his four siblings, she was the only one who migrated to Pakistan after partition. So um, uh, um, uh, the Major General has a wonderful slideshow that we will uh, <clears throat> proceed with as we go along uh, with this presentation. And I would like to begin with a very simple question to the author of the book. What were the circumstances or the inspiration that led you to write this book? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amna. And uh, uh, could I, before setting off on that, uh, thank um, Samad and Najib, Saibzada's two sons, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be here today with us, uh, for uh, helping me uh, with this biography. I'd also like to thank uh, Muniza for sharing with me her mother's autobiography, which gave me a lot of background on the family. 
and it's uh, where they came from and what they did. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, Mr. Iqbal Saleh Mohammed uh, of Paramount Books, who um, seemed to have a passion for publishing anything on Sahibzada Yaqub. And when I sent him this book, he said, Ye to Allah ki taraf se I didn't know him, uh, I didn't know the publishers, but it was just one of those things when God wills, uh, things happen. Um, my uh, parents knew... The left, uh, left side. No, it's... Thank you. Where do I point? There? Yes. Okay, my parents knew um, Sahib Dada from the time uh, when he was adjutant of the Viceroy's bodyguard in Delhi in 46-47. Um, he had come back from the prisoner of war camp and uh, my father was private secretary to Field Marshal Okunlek, Commander in Chief India, and this was taken on my sister's birthday at the CNC's lodge in Simla. And on the left is um, uh, Okunlek, and then you can see Saibzada Yaqub, and uh, my mother Tyra. Um, sadly, my father is screened off. Uh, there's Anis Ahmed Khan, who uh, was my papa, and he was in one of the same prisoner of war camps as Saibzada Yaqub. So it's, uh, this photograph itself uh, has a complete story that one could uh, weave around it. Between my mother and my father, was his uh, G1. So since then, of course, the association uh, developed and we as children found him coming in and out of the house. Uh, I never really had the um, privilege of serving with him because by the time uh, I sort of got anywhere in the army, he had retired. Um, but really, I came to know a lot about his professional career when I wrote the history of the Pakistan Ahmed Corps. Uh, 600 pages with about 600 illustrations. Wow. Uh, going back to 1939-40, which is the Indian mechanization of the cavalry. And of course, Saibzada then features um, occasionally in the book. Uh, a much more detailed analysis of him when he was a major general commanding the 1st Armored Division some uh, nice, funny anecdotes that I picked up from uh, different people which I could share later. But then, of course, when I got a little more serious about writing the book, uh, Muniza shared with me um, the, uh, her mother's autobiography, which I mentioned. And because I was dealing with the Armored Corps, I already had the history of his regiment. And therefore, that period when they developed mechanized and they went into battle uh, till Sardada Yaqub was captured, was covered in fair amount of detail and he is mentioned at one or two. So it, it gave me a lot of background information that I had um, not previously. And ultimately, of course, uh, Samad shared with me his prisoner of war notebook. And that was an absolute gold mine. And that's the first page with a French verse written on top and you have written the translation there. And it wasn't a diary. It wasn't a diary of events because as we know, Saibzada Yaqub didn't record, he never wrote an autobiography, never wrote, you know, what he was doing on a daily basis, too boring. It was about the books he read. It was about, and I'll talk about that a little later, uh, seven pages on French cuisine um, the uh, translations from English, French to English, all the various cuts of meat, etc., uh, cheeses. Long list of wines. Long list of wines. <laughs> yeah, long list of wines. And for the man who didn't drink, yeah. I, it, I mean, it's <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> they, they, uh, all sorts of wines, and what's the difference? Between, I mean, I learned a lot from just re reading uh, that. But uh, very interesting. And about five pages of addresses um, and some difficult to make out who all was there, but of course, my papa Anis Ahmed Khan and Kumara Manglam, who gave, became the Indian Army Chief, Unsabke names and addresses there on record. I think.
Nick. Yes. So um, we'd like to proceed further. And um, sorry, my apologies. And finally, um, gentlemen, who I must, I should have mentioned right at the beginning, uh, Arif Khan, who was his, who is his nephew, um, and he's a banker uh, working in Indonesia, the son of the eldest brother. Uh, who um, left his job as a professor in Aligarh University when uh, Sir Samad died in 1943 and came back to Rampur. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of uh, family affairs that he had to take care of, but he became the repository of all family documents, it seems. And Arif is a family historian who, on the left, you can see, he provided me all the letters that Saib Dada Yaqub wrote from the prisoner war camp or that were written to the family in Delhi, uh, to, uh, from Delhi to their family, photographs, etc., etc. So very valuable. And finally, um, I did some research at the National Archives in UK. I got hold of the um, uh, Red Cross reports on their monthly visits to the prisoner war camps. So there is the camp, you can see PG-63. Uh, the um, Indian local commandant was uh, Kumara Mangalam, uh, Yaya Khan was his adjutant, and of course there was Tikka and Hassam al and Saibzada Yaqub and others uh, in the same camp. Thank you. Arif Khan also shared this uh, sketch, which is on the cover of uh, General Saab's book, which Saibzada Yaqub Khan made in Syria as a young man when he was uh, sent uh, with 18th Cavalry to Africa. And he was a, and Arif Khan said that, please do share this information, that here is a soldier sitting about to go to war. But he was more interested in, you know, he made a sketch of himself and sent it to his father, which is on the cover of the book. Um, so Ms. Shamsi, now a question for you. Please tell us more about uh, Sahab Zada's family antecedents and um, the environment and atmosphere that he was born in and came from. Well, oh, the, well, that, that's my grandfather, um, Sahib Zada Abdul Samad Khan. Oh, well, well it's, it's, it's all given there, but the, uh, yes. Speak in the mic. Oh, you can't hear, okay. Um, the family background is basically, they were Rohila Patans and they belonged to a place called Najibabad, where part of the, one of the relatives uh, mutinied, and the others were there. But anyway, the bottom line was the British stormed the place, and they, um, they executed the, the, uh, the forebears and, and the rulers of the place. And uh, they had to, uh, <coughs> my uh, mother's family, they all had to flee. And then it, it is actually the subject by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan wrote the uh, Revolt of Bijnor, and that, that is part of that book. And later, then the British felt, oh, well, we, uh, you know, like the way the British did, oh, we executed some of them unfairly, so then they gave some of them a pension, not my. Actually, one of my relatives tells me about how his grandmother told him when she was fleeing from Najibabad, a British Tommy tried to snatch the gold bangles off her hand, but he couldn't pull them off because she'd worn them. You know, these kind of stories we grew up with. So this was the, uh, the, the my mother's, my uncle's paternal family. They, um, they then became, they were rehab, they be, then became very keen on education and, and um, you know, modernity and so on. And they, they moved to Rampur uh, because they, they were, there, they were, there was all this intermarriage because Rampurs were also Rahilas and there was intermarriage, they were connected to them. And they uh, then moved to Rampur where um, one of my relatives became the regent and my uh, uncle, uh, my grandfather then became chief minister. And um, again, all of them were very uh, keen on education. They were, um, my, they were, they were very much into books also. Mamu, ma, mamu, my, my khala, well, there the th um, th two mamus um, and Yakub mamu. He went to the military academy, and, and he wanted to be a soldier since he was little. But my mother says they used to rag him, and they used to call him Major Saab. 
because apparently the major was the highest rank an Indian could attain under the British colonials. And uh, he just loved the army. My, my grandfather, of course, had a very, dis that is the family home, Rosaville, which, um, which actually is still there, it's not quite like that, but I mean, I have stayed there, especially as a child. And it, it had, um, it was a beautiful house. It had, um, it had Chinese carpets. I remember these Chinese carpets and these, of course, the Zanana Mardana was no longer there, um, that division, but there was a section that was the Mardana and then there was a sort of big corridor and then there was a Zanana at the back and uh, where, where, where I used to stay and where I, where, where I used to play. And it had um, beautiful china wear up in the dining room. And my grandmother lived there. So this is the family home, and this is where I imagined he grew up. It, it was called Rosaville. There was a garden with a lily pond with roses all are, uh, growing all around it. And beyond, this was actually a lawn. You could look out at it. And beyond the lawn were tall mango trees, and there were the mango groves. So it was a very beautiful place, and this is where he must have grown up. And this is uh, where here he is with all his siblings. There is my eldest uncle, Yusuf, on the left. Uh, Yunus, no, <laughs> I'm looking there. Uncle y Yunus, Yusuf on the right. Uncle Yunus, who actually joined the Indian Army on the left. My grandmother in the center. My um, mother at the back on the right. And on the left is my Khala Fakhra and her husband, Mehmood Zafar Khan. Khala, my Khala is interesting in relation to Mamu because she is a great artist. She, she was a wonderful artist. And the, the brother and sister, my Yaqub Mamu, apparently had this great bond of art. I didn't know about this art. I had no idea that he sat around uh, in, in the army learning to draw that beautiful portrait. And interestingly, when I sent it to my Fakhra Khala's uh, daughter, she said, oh, but it's just like one of my mother's paintings. So it was quite interesting. Um, though later on in life, I don't have any recollection of him drawing or painting or really, he, he was much more into philosophy and languages and, you know, uh, and the importance of languages. That was the other great thing of how learning another, I'm, I'm sadly monolingual and um, more or less, I mean, there's Urdu, of course, but my strong language is English. And he was always going on about how a language changes your entire worldview. And I remember he said, now supposing Mrs. Thatcher could speak Urdu, what do you think it was, I remember this so well about Mrs. Thatcher, how do you think it would change her worldview? You know, and uh, that was just one thing that comes to my mind, the top of my head. My daughter, Kamla, who's now a novelist, she was, when she was about 13, he sat her down and gave her a long speech, he's written about it, on Hamlet, on the translation of Hamlet, and sometimes how a translation can make the original seem not different, but clarify a detail, throw an insight into the detail that the original you may have to ponder over. And he's, um, he quoted from Hamlet and the German translation of Hamlet. And age 13, apparently, she was much fascinated by this. I'm sure at age 13, I was an extremely boring child and would have said, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, but there we are. So, and, and, and he had this, um, and he was a very loving brother to my mother. I mean, she was his only sibling. I mean, she adored him, but he was so caring, I can't tell you, right to the end of her days. Um, so, I could carry um, on endlessly. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Shamsi. So now we'll proceed with uh, General Saab and um, get back to 1939 and 1940. Um, when exactly was the Sahabzada commissioned in the Indian Army? And what was the historic context when he left India as part of the 18th Cavalry, King Edward's own, which was sent to Egypt? Okay, Sahabzada was from one of the last regular courses that passed out of Ayame <laughs> before the Second World War. In fact, he was commissioned when the war had broken out in 1940. And this is his um, IMA photograph. Um, obviously, he was not amongst the top runners in the, uh, as a cadet, because he wouldn't have been standing in the back row. Uh, <laughs> he would have been somewhere seated with one of these cross belts. But it just goes to show, you know, some people are late starters as far as 
their professional field concerned. Mobilization uh, to go be Home Secretary of Jammu and Kashmir. So, um, Sardada couldn't go up, but he motored down uh, to see his son before he sailed. And um, I'm told he stayed in Flashman's Hotel. So that was the only decent hotel in, in Pindi. But that was the last meeting, unfortunately, because while Sarzada Yaqub was in the prison of war camp, so some had passed away. 64, uh, hardly any age. Um, probably it was a heart attack, but the family doesn't know. Okay. Um, we've already talked about that uh, sketch uh, that he made. Uh, the regiment landed up in Egypt, and then after a brief encounter with uh, the Africa Corps, it went off to Syria for internal security duties, where he did this uh, sketch, and then came back into Egypt. And why I've got this photograph on the right side, the other's not in it, but this was the sort of equipment they had. They were a motor cavalry regiment um, because the British didn't have enough tanks. And as their CEO put it, uh, they were neither fish nor fowl nor good red headed because uh, they were supposed to take on the German armor, but they had uh, two pounder anti tank guns and um, really didn't have any staying power, as they would call it. And so the famous Battle of Ghazala, uh, in which the um, Rommel with four armored divisions um, did a hook around uh, the British uh, strong defenses along the Ghazala line, which were brigades which were uh, with minefields and barbed wire and all that, so he avoided all that, and he came in through a desert flank, and the first brigade that he hit was the 3rd Indian Motor Brigade. And that's why the 3rd Indian Motor Brigade has gone down into history. And I think it's about four hours it took for them to overrun. And why I put this painting is because this was the 25 pounder uh, field battery commanded by Kumaramangalam. That was within the area of 18th Cavalry and um, with uh, Sikh gunners. And this painting hangs in India in the uh, uh, mess of two field regiment. And the only people who really managed to knock out the German tanks were these 25 pounder artillery guns which were firing in the direct fire role. They took out 80 German tanks, German and Italian tanks. So it, it was uh, quite a feat. But of course, um, at the end of it, uh, Saizada Yaqub was a prisoner of war, 17 officers, 600 soldiers from the brigade. But I'll talk about that But later. what also what happened at the Battle of Tobruk after Ghazala? No, actually, it was before Ghazala. Right, right. Uh, where uh, 18th Cavalry was uh, part of the uh, defenses of the siege of the brook. It was the only Indian regiment along with an Australian division over there. And um, Saibdaza Saab was there um, under fire and um, obviously, you know, developing experience as things went on. Um, we've heard a lot about the Australian defense of the Battle of Tobruk and the famous desert rats of the 7th Australian Division, but much less about the equally impressive uh, defense of Tobruk by Indian soldiers. So was there anyone who acknowledged their, um, their work at Tobruk, the Indian soldiers, especially the 18th Cavalry? Yes, actually when they uh, extricated from there and came back to re-equip uh, in Egypt, uh, Auchinleck visited the regiment and he was he had a lot of uh, praise for them. So now let's proceed to the scenario that led to the Sabzada's capture and the preceding years when he was prisoner of war and which camps was he interned in in those four years? Okay. Um, his notebook has one page which says my wanderings as a POW. In fact, that's the title I wanted to give the book, but um, Baal Saleh Mohammed Saab uh, suggested this title, and I don't argue with my publisher. So, <laughs> but um, you can see um, in Libya, uh, three different, and these were not 
prisoner war camps per se, they were more transit camps. Uh, and then in Italy, um, Tutorano was near where they landed by ship. Again, it was a transit camp. But the next three, Sermona, Aversa, Avizano, Aversa, uh, these were very much uh, prisoner war camps. And then um, period of escape, subsequently recapture one or two camps in uh, Italy again, and then uh, Matrix Tribu in Czechoslovakia, uh, again a German camp, and then finally ended up in Brunswick. Um, so the Sabzada was the Sabzada was a man of multi-dimensional faculties, and in the book it definitely comes across that these three, uh, these four years in captivity were literally like a four-year university for him. He took up an intense study of languages and engrossed himself in the study of philosophy as well. Uh, tell us a little about the width and depth of his interests. Okay. Um, just before that, this was his camp in Aversa. It was primarily for Indians. This sketch was done for um, a major general Khalid who was in the Indian Medical Corps and he was a doctor um, in the same camp. His son shared with me. And this was uh, the camp commandant. This character appears in Saibzada's <coughs> notebook. Who, um, small Italian colonel who had a very short fuse. He's been described as. And um, one day he got annoyed about something. And of course, all 700 prisoners were fallen in. And he didn't know any English. For 10 minutes, you know, he shouted and screamed and waved his stick at them and then finally turned to the translator and said, translate, and the translator said, the commandant is very angry. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everybody burst out laughing, and so there was another 10 minutes, so. Uh, so, okay, um, sorry, finally. This very nice picture, uh, Yaya Khan, when he became chief designate, he visited Delhi in 1966, and a return visit by Kumara Mangalam, uh, who was the Indian chief at that time. Uh, and this was taken in Dalpindi. Um, three prisoners of war, you can see, ex-comrades, Tikka, Yaya, General Khalil, and uh, Kumara Mangalam. And by the way, Kumara Mangalam was the man who was responsible for reconstructing the Indian army after the 1965 war and was therefore in many ways the architect of the performance of the Indian armies in 1971. Oh, so that's, um, sorry, this seems to have. Okay. Um, there was a doctor who was sharing a room with Sarzada Yaqub uh, in Aversa, and this is what he wrote uh, about Saibzada Yaqub. One of the most intelligent young lads, in the two months he had brushed up his knowledge of French and was learning German. He seemed to name normally agree with Aristotle that intellectual attainment was the greatest pleasure. He normally agreed with Aristotle that intellectual attainment is the greatest pleasure of life. And two days ago I got this letter um, a copy of this letter. There's a friend of mine called P. Bowman who is researching a book on the Indian POWs in Europe. His book so has been published. Hmm? His book has been published. Nee. He's doing Uski another one. Kitab hmm. thi on uh, the Indian contingent, contingent. at Dunkirk. Hmm. There were four companies, mule companies, which were there at Dunkirk uh, being evacuated, which nobody knew about. Um, and he wrote a book which was published. But he, um, in his research, shared this letter with me two days ago, um, written uh, in reply to a letter from a major um, in England from Kent, who Saibzada doesn't, didn't know. But um, I'm sure you'd be very interested to hear from you, he talks about his father. I've received two letters and some clothing parcels from home, uh, so I am fairly well off as far as clothes are concerned. This is Aversa. Ours is a new camp, and this is, you know, a young boy of 22, you know, so you can put yourself in that. Um, ours is a new camp, and we are getting organized slowly. 
we've got a small library going and a very nice little reading room. He was, that was his areas of interest. Raya Khan used to say Ki ye admi, he never tried to escape, hmm. which is technically not correct, but the fact yeah. is that he wasn't interested because the success rate was very low. So what is the point of putting in all that? And um, outside the wire, there's a playing field and after, um, spend the afternoons playing basketball. I spend most of my time learning German and polishing up my French. This morning I finished a very amusing play. I wouldn't dare read it in French because <laughs> I don't know the language and beautifully written, thank you once again, and etc. So uh, this reflects what his, and he then goes off to Matastavu, and I think that is uh, the best thing that happened to him. Um, Saibzada was um, uh, read uh, Zorashtar. Um, Saibzada Yaqub read Plato, um, he read their philosophies, and part of the philosophy is that um, the human beings are generally living in a dark cave, and um, it's only through education and enlightenment that they can break free into the light. And that analogy, I think, applies to Saibada Yaqub because those prisoner war camps were dark cages, but it was through that process that he, and you can see that they were in Matrish Trabu, there were 1,600 officers. Most of them were professionals who had been recruited during the war, as war broke out. They were bankers and doctors and professors and whatever else. They had a mini university going, and they used to hold exams, and that is where Saibzada received his formal education. Actually, that was, and I see that that time that he, couldn't escape was because the Almighty had ordained that this man has not yet broken free into the light and he needs to remain, and I may be wrong, but he needs to remain in that darkness more to ultimately come up and we can see the enlightened man that he rose uh, to be. I'm going to go ahead and ask Parkinson's next question. Sorry, just one last, I mean, this is one page from his diary which gives the books on philosophy and by different philosophers. And 12 pages of books noted in his uh, notebook, in his notebook, 12 pages. And I've given a background. Thank you. Thank you, General Saab. <laughs> Ambassador Fatmi, I would like to ask you that in the years that you knew the Saab Zada, did he talk about his prisoner of war years? Did he share any uh, anecdotes or did he share any experiences with you? Thank you very much. I had the good fortune of knowing the Saab Zada for many, many years. In fact, I met him for the first time when I got posted to the United States. And we, I worked under him for about three or four years. And then General Zia decided to send him to Moscow. And there's a story behind that as well, because it caught everyone by surprise as to why the Saif Zada was being shifted from Washington to Moscow. And there's a reference to it in the US magazines and newspapers that General Zia was thinking of of an opening to the Soviet Union and felt that the Saibzada, given his experience, was ideally suited for this particular thing. So the Saibzada landed in Moscow and to my good fortune, he asked me to come with him to Moscow, so there I was. Since Moscow was a much smaller embassy, since Moscow was a much smaller embassy and both he and I spoke Russian, I had already studied at the Moscow University, and therefore we became much closer. And yes, he did discuss some of the events at the time when he was a prisoner of camp. But the more remarkable thing was that 
he was he gave me no impression of what i had visualized about pakistani senior army officers with apologies to general saab here i mean here was a general whose interest was philosophy poetry politics hardly were discussing war tactics or his own bravery or other things related to the time he had spent in the army i was also very impressed that by the mere fact of having been a prisoner of war he should have acquired fluency in three major subjects i mean i've spent i've had three postings in moscow and i still think that i need more time to actually understand russian if i have to read war or peace or anna karenina i have read them in russian but to really understand the beauty of those gems of literature in their original is simply beyond but the sahabzada did read it and he challenged me to read it and then we debated and discussed it so he became more than merely an ambassador a very loving affectionate senior who nearly was seriously interested in making me a better person and a better diplomat and then thereafter in 1982 when president zia decided to move him from paris to islamabad as the foreign minister i want to tell you that he was very reluctant to return back to islamabad because he was convinced that he would not be able to adjust to the political ambiance of the capital at that particular time but he did come and he chose me to me to be his chief of staff or in our the foreign office we call it the director general foreign minister's office and i stayed with him for 5 years i accompanied him all over the world we sat in on all the meetings whether they were in washington or moscow or beijing and it was remarkable his intelligence and more so his grasp of global politics and his presentation of pakistan's core interests were absolutely fascinating i remember that uh, we were in moscow for chenenko's funeral and president uh, bush who was then the vice president had come to moscow and general zia had gone from here and bush asked his cia chief to give us a presentation as to what they expected and would happen in the soviet union and general zia asked the sahabzada saying well general zia of course thankfully didn't know much about the soviet union <laughs> but anyway uh, uh, the foreign minister gave a presentation and the americans differed with it totally differed with it and then a couple few years later president bush had the courtesy and the grace to actually acknowledge that the presentation made by the sahabzada was more prescient was more accurate as to what would be happening to the soviet union and i remember his remark in the in the white house years later he said we were spending billions on the cia all i had to do was to come to yakub and ask him and he would have given me far more valuable information the sahabzada was cut no push senior we are talk push junior of course didn't in, was not interested in these profound things you know <laughs> his his interests in life were elsewhere <coughs> so we had acquired a stature a position in diplomacy and the approach to the issues that were confronting us at a time at least at the level of the foreign minister wherein he could stand whether he was talking to the americans or the russians or the british or the chinese or the germans in germany i must uh, relate one tale and then you can stop me he went for a meeting with uh, hans dietrich genscher the foreign minister and at the end of the meeting he said please skip the official dinner because i want you to go back to the hotel and write out a report on this meeting this was a very important meeting and the president knows about you know, should know about it i said i would love to do it but in this case you have to prepare the report and he said what what's wrong with you 
I said, sir, you went in, you greeted him in German, and I presumed you would switch to English, but you never came back to English. I haven't understood a word of what you two were talking about. He said, oh, Lord. I said, I can't help you. I, I'm sorry, but... So anyway, the poor man wrote down the whole thing in longhand, and we sent it. Now, for a prisoner of war, not merely to learn a few slangs or pick up a few words here and there is quite common, but to be able to converse and discuss issues of politics, philosophy, poetry, is simply beyond. I mean, you know, I'm a mere mortal. Sabzada was somewhere up there in the heavens. And the last thing is, another big surprise which I need to mention is, that whenever Fast Saib came to Moscow, the Saib Zada would ensure that a dinner was arranged for, Saib, for Fast Saib. Fast was, of course, a much sought after person in the Soviet Union. The Soviets had huge respect for him, regard for Fast Saib. And the Saib Zada and Fast Saib would go on till three in the morning, challenging each other as to who could recall more of Fasa's poetry than the poet himself. <laughs> it was amazing. And, of course, once when the Sahazada was in a good mood, I said, sir, the only reason why you beat Fasai was because by three in the morning, Fasai was already in an excellent mood elsewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Fatmi. One last question, which we can uh, address briefly, um, both of you, and uh, then we'll open the uh, floor to a Q&A. Uh, so th my question is that your book is now become a part of, and you know, Sahabzada Yaqub Khan's experiences have become a part of a rediscovery of sorts of viewing the Second World War in, in a different way. Um, in fact, Guy Bowman's book, The Indian Contingent, uh, The Forgotten Soldiers of, uh, Muslim Soldiers of Dunkirk, is one such an example. So there is a debunking of the colonial narrative on what the Second World War was about because there were at least three million Punjabi Muslims, mostly Punjabi Muslims, who, were, who fought on the, in the Second World War arena. So how would you, um, you know, what are your views on this? on this particular thought. Thank you. Uh, uh, 2.5 million. 2.5 million Indians. But the interesting thing is that uh, there were 1.3 million in the First World War, out of which 45% were Punjabi, were from the Punjab. Um, and I say that because you know it included the six. But in the Second World War, and the British learned because there was a near rebellion in the First World War uh, during, at the end because the recruitment demands were so heavy and they couldn't be met. Um, so in the Second World War, by the time that came around, they had advanced their recruiting base. So um, it was 25%, but then 25% of 2.5 million, obviously the figure uh, become, but I'm trying to put the perspective, uh, ratio in perspective. But of course, the soldiers from Punjab and Frontier uh, were the front line, and Dogras uh, were front line. The rest, like Madrasis, are more technical into Signal Corps, engineers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last five, ten years, as uh, Amna is saying, there's been an increasing awareness, particularly in Great Britain, of the role that the Indian Army played. And frankly, people like Okunlek, um, who was born and bred in the British Indian Army, said very frankly that we couldn't have done without them. Because right from <clears throat> uh, Singapore and Malaya and into Burma and uh, the Middle East, guarding the oil and across to North Africa, and um, there were three Indian divisions fighting in Italy. And... Um, <laughs> Montgomery, who had a very jaundiced view of the British uh, Indian Army, because they say he was not accepted uh, when he was passed out from uh, the Sandhurst Academy into the British Indian Army. So he always, 
and in the battle of alamein which was his uh, glory glory yeah. there were no indian divisions do teen the they were well trained divisions but he didn't employ them and yet by the time the north africa campaign finished he had a very high opinion of the indian divisions and there were three which were operating in italy fighting hardcore german forces the troops and did an exceedingly well job so um thank have you. i answered yes thank you and ambassador fatmi if you'd like to round up let me let me relate another story i was also very intrigued to know the sahibzada much better because i had lost virtually all members of my family in the civil war in east pakistan and i was out of the country otherwise i would have been another number in that figure and so i was very curious i said uh, does the sahibzada represent the army that went on this carnage because he didn't fit in in my view he just didn't fit in so i would ask him a lot of questions and he was very reluctant but once in a while he would open up and one of the things i later found out with general saab can check was that saab zada was number 1 under consideration when ayub khan was thinking of appointing a new chief and a group of generals led by general yahya planned to send the saab zada out on a course to the uk imperial defense college so that he wouldn't be here so sometimes when i would talk, talk to the to the gentleman this general whose interest was philosophy and poetry and wonder that had had he stayed on would he have prevented what happened in later years because he would have never ever sanctioned what the army did in east pakistan and it is also very clear from the last three letters that he wrote as the commander eastern command to his commander in chief which he shared with me a, a little before he passed away and he continued to urge rawal pindi and he used these words and they are etched in my memory i have not trained my soldiers to kill my own people and he went on urging that the only solution of the problem of east pakistan lay through dialogue both of these advisers of course fell on deaf ears and we know what happened thank you so much um i'd like to thank the panelists who are here today miss muniza shamsi ambassador fatmi and lieutenant general hamid and before we open the floor to the questions we have a short statement by ambassador riaz mohammad khan which will be who was meant to be on our panel and which will be read out by mr shaukat farid so if we could pass a mic on ji sir please yeah. go ahead by the way what i stated you find confirmation of it in a book written by the british high commissioner ek second agar aap ijazat dein what i just stated the ambassador or the high commissioner at that point of time in pakistan was sir morris james sir morris james in his book actually corroborates what i have just stated he said the hot candidate to succeed the field marshal as the next commander in chief is general yaqub khan thank you wo oh, general ayub khan apni diary mein bhi likhte hain that he was very sad when a sahibzada yaqub um got the sack because he had him as the next or main keeper thank you ji sir ah uh, my name is shaukat farid i am a colleague of um, uh, mr tariq fatmi and uh, i think somebody else is here from the foreign office but we all belong to the foreign office at a particular time and worked very closely with saheb zada yaqub khan the focus of this discussion has been mostly on the military dimension of uh, uh, saheb zada's uh, uh, career uh, but i think his role in the diplomacy 
in the international arena. Sir, we can't far, hear you if you could put this up. Far uh, extends what he achieved in the army, in my humble opinion. And um, uh, Tariq Fatmi Sahib and uh, Rafat Mehdi were two people who worked very closely with him in the foreign office. But there's a third person who also worked very closely with him was Riyaz Mohammed Khan. Uh, Riyaz Mohammed Khan was our foreign secretary uh, and uh, was in, in charge of the dialogue on Afghanistan to, to return uh, peace to Afghanistan and very closely collaborated with him. And uh, Saif Zadar Yaqub Khan was a key element in achieving the settlement in Afghanistan. So here is a message from him uh, and it focuses more on his uh, political dimension. Uh, age and new technology. <laughs> so uh, he says, Riyaz says, uh, Sahib Zadar Yaqub Khan was a classic personality, an extraordinarily dignified man of immaculate style, impeccable poise and etiquette, exquisite in thought and conversation, and of course a linguist of rare genius. He always had a presence that attracted attention and respect. Perhaps in one word, his personality was well described by former U.S. Secretary of State George Schultz. Uh, he had, uh, uh, Riaz had met him in 2011 at Hoover Center in Stanford University. Schultz asked him, asked me about Saheb Zada Saheb and remarked that among colleagues he was referred to as the Prince of Foreign Ministers. Uh, if I were to put it differently, he was elegance personified. Saheb Zada Saheb approached and analyzed every issue with logic and prided himself in being rational. All those who worked with him had been witnesses to his scarlet thread in whatever he discussed. An important example was how he described the agenda for the proximity talks in, on Afghanistan in Geneva. I was part of the delegation. Saheb Zada's the style was to gather members of the delegation in a semicircle and discuss issues, mostly in a dialectical manner, asking questions. Pakistan's side believed that establishment of a broad-based government or a government of national reconciliation was necessary to return to return of peace in Afghanistan, and therefore it ought to be a part of the agenda. Uh, discussions in Islamabad with President Zia had agreed on this point. At Geneva, however, the UN intermediary for the talks refused to consider such an item as United Nations mandate did not allow it. Short on time. Uh, through extensive Sir, we are a little short on time. Okay, I'll cut short. But uh, basically, I think he uh, is given all these details. Um, uh, how Saib Zada's view at that time in those negotiations proved to be the right one six years later when Gorbachev came to power. So, um, We'd like to open the floor for questions and maybe we can share this as an email amongst people who might be interested in reading it. That's a very good idea, right? I'll send it to you later on. Thank you so much, <laughs> thank you sir. Um, so the floor is open for questions. And the mic is right there. Any questions? Fatmi uh, Saab has very candidly mentioned Saab Zadar Yaqub Saab, uh, convincing the president of America in what post-Soviet Union era could be. Um, my question is, uh, was it lack of leadership at the top? Why couldn't a very convincing, educated, philosophical general convince another general not to take action in East Pakistan? Where does the fault line lie in this? Why the US president agreed to his analysis, and our own president either didn't understand what is happening or lack of leadership quality 
we would like to know in the historical perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. You know, it's never good to speak ill of those who have left us. But I think uh, the, the, the gentlemen or the people in power at that point of time lacked both the intelligence and the character. From the stories that have emerged, for, even from army officers who were present at that point of time, uh, it's quite sad what we read about it. And the Sahabzada made one last desperate travel to Rawal Pindi to convince the powers that be that military action would be disastrous. And he was not even given a hearing. And the general impression, the leadership was that General Yaqub Khan has kind of chicken out. But I will relate to you another outstanding officer of the Navy, Admiral Asan. Two had advice from Dhaka. Two had advice from Dhaka that there was no military solution. Even the Air Force was yeah. So, unfortunate. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one question at the back, right there. Uh, besides, sir? Well, I'm Farooq. I was uh, ADC with Janat Zia when Sada Yaqub was a foreign minister and then of course throughout the service one knew him one called on him and somehow he liked me i would like to have one suggestion and i would like to correct the perception military mind is trained could you, could you speak a little louder please i said military mind is trained to think ahead and to say that sabda yakub who was eastern command commander had not planned for the worst contingency is incorrect. I would suggest that you read the latest book by Bigde Karal Ali Aga, who was there in action. And you would know that when these plans were made, yes, there was a difference of opinion as far as how to handle the political situation. And Sabda Yaqub Khan um, rightly uh, differed, like Admiral Asin. But, sir, the plans of March were not impromptu. If you read this book, I am sure uh, Bigder uh, Ali Hamad must have read that. It gives complete details as to when these plans were made. So, situation was evolving and Sabda Yaqub, who was a military mind and who thought well ahead, had already planned certain moves. This was my suggestion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, anyone would like to say anything else before we... Is there a question on that side? Mr. Zahid Ahmed? Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm Farid Malik. Uh, during my days in Islamabad, I used to meet him very frequently in the gym at the Marriott. Mm. So he was very fond of physical fitness also. Yes. I think that's another aspect of his life and that swimming. has to be highlighted. And swimming. Can I just say something because I don't think I'd like to get up from this forum without having said. And we talk of the tragedy of East Pakistan and we talk of the army. And let me just say that there were other very powerful actors in this also, yeah. without naming. Yeah. So please, when you talk of East Pakistan and the tragedy, just keep that balance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm referring uh, to the political environment. There was a very strong political environment in West Pakistan. <coughs> that didn't allow the army to act as it should have in East Pakistan or not act, to put it that way. Can I? Can I? The West Pakistanis wanted to get rid of uh, East Pakistan. We thought it was a burden on us. Ladies and gentlemen, the time, unfortunately, for our session is over. 
Uh, Ms. Shamsi, if you would like to say something to well, close. I had actually, um, going back to family history, I had quite, um, he loved poetry. He loved discussing poetry with my mother. They were always uh, reciting poetry. But you know, the thing that they were very aware of, they, he came from a family of poets. The, my, uh, again, the two families that intermarried, but my nani belonged to the princely family of Luharu, and they were connected to Ghalib. And they were, um, uh, they were connected to Dar. They had all these great leading poets within their family. So there was not just an awareness of literature, there was a kind of personal absorption. And they were very aware of this. And my eldest aunt, who was, became the Begum of Rampur, she actually wrote poetry, uh, which I never realized until I saw a poetry book that my mother done. She actually wrote poetry under the name of Azmat. And when she was around, my mother, my uncle, and so he had these bonds with his siblings, with his sisters, as well as his brothers, and, and with the art and the poetry and so on. The sisters was the poetry, and it was also part of his own in inheritance. And there is much more I could say about him. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. A wonderful tribute to Sahab Zada Yaqub Khan. Thank you.